Okay, so next we have uh, Nudo Medeiros, who's the head of the cybersecurity department at EDP. I'll hand over to Nudo. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Nuno Medeiros. I'm heading the OT cybersecurity department at EDP. And I will briefly introduce what has been our strategy towards more resilient and secure uh, mission critical substations. So, First, a few words on EDP. EDP Distribution is part of the EDP group. It's uh, a global energy player, which is positioned um, worldwide, mainly due to investments on renewable generation. But anyway, we have three DSOs within the company, a Spanish, a Portuguese, and a Brazilian one. So EDP Distribution is the Portuguese uh, DSO. It covers more than 99% of uh, Portuguese mainland. And uh, of course, as all the SOs, our mission is to assure a proper exploration, maintenance, and development of uh, the distribution power grid. Uh, we have a wide and complex set of assets that we need to maintain, manage daily, from 500 primary substations for 220,000 kilometers of lines, more than 6 million customers. So it's, it's, it's quite a complex environment that we need to manage properly on a daily basis. So I will focus my presentation, of course, on primary substations. Those are vital assets to us. And uh, mainly, if you think about a substation, a primary substation, it's, it's a key asset for day-to-day -day operations within the grid because it covers, it's a complex um, asset that covers uh, the highest level of the DSO power grid. It has an average of 2,400 customers, at least at EDP, which means that if you have a problem in there, it will affect thousands and thousands of customers. Then it's a quite expensive and complex environment, so we need to deal with it very carefully. And uh, my question, and what I will try to, under, to explain throughout my presentation is, 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 is if, in fact, we are um, under uh, physical and cyber threats within the substation. So if, if it's something, if the substation is something, that needs to be properly addressed in terms of uh, its cybersecurity posture. So my opinion is that, of course, we need to focus on substations because for more than 20, 30 years, we have been digitizing substations, focusing mainly on supervision, control, automation. So if you digitize, you, of course, expose your substations to cyber threats. And this is something that it's, I think, clear for uh, most of the people today. And also, you know, very recently, um, uh, recent events have shown that substations are actually under threat. So if you think about the Ukraine incident, uh, both in 2015 and 16, the first one uh, struck DSOs, the, the second one struck TSOs. But on both events, the substations were the last mile, the last asset that, that was attacked and actually brought some impact to customers, to society itself. So despite the fact that they used phishing attacks to get to the IT network, then after getting to the IT network, they got to the OT network, then substations. But anyway, besides the, the, the very complex uh, attacking vector, substations were vulnerable. Substations were attacked, and based, basically, based on those attacks, um, there was a huge impact on customers in Ukraine in December, both in 2015 and 16. So this is not fiction, it's reality. Substations are vulnerable and you probably need to do something about it. So that's a bit what I, uh, I will explain now, what we are doing about it. So if we think about cybersecurity, whether it's a substation, smart metering, um, SCADA environment, you need to do risk management. That's, that's the first approach. And, and the objective here is, of course, to evaluate what are the existing threats for your environment what is the likelihood and the right impact or the, the correct impact that those threats might have to your environment so you can evaluate exactly what are the risks. After that evaluation process, of course, you can prioritize and then start a risk mitigation process. So the risk mitigation process is when you actually do something to reduce or mitigate the risks that you have on substations. So if you think about risk mitigations, you, there are many things you, you, you can do. For example, you can apply a mix uh, of controls between uh, preventing incidents from happening or at least detect them as fast as possible. Or if you are not able to do so, then you can also respond fast enough to reduce the impact that you have from a specific security incident. So while you put together your risk mitigation strategy, you need to think about this mix of 
controls, of mechanisms that you have available to reduce the risks that you evaluated and then that you, of course, need to mitigate. So, of course, that we are talking about substations, we are talking about OT technology, so easier said than done. It's not easy to implement security on a substation uh, because you don't have one substation. You have hundreds of substations that have different generations, so there are quite a few obstacles while implementing security on substations. Starting with diversity, again, as I mentioned, we have been building substations for uh, dozens of years, which means that we have many different technologies in there, we have many different vendors, and even from the different vendors that we have, we have different generations. So we have a very diverse, heterogeneous environment that we need to address uh, together. And then performance, because again, I, I explained that digitalization has started 30 years ago. So you can imagine that the performance needed to use technology from today on those very ancient, very legacy environments, it's quite difficult. Then they are also inflexible, and not only that the technology is inflexible, but also uh, the vendors. If you talk with your vendors of um, RTUs and try to explain that you need to install, for example, an antivirus in there, they will probably raise you some problems because they are not sure if by installing that, you might jeopardize you know, the operation um, of, of that asset. So in some sense, not only you are very limited on what you can do on OT technology, but also the vendors itself, themselves, they pro protect them uh, or their service from installing uh, third-party software. And I must say, OT, at least OT from the past, is very unsecure by design. So existing software, existing communication protocols have no security capabilities. So you cannot rely on software or uh, communication protocols to implement um, security. You need to add extra layers for security. And then you have physical constraints on many substations. The old ones, you cannot easily deploy new technology, new equi equipment, and most substations are unattended. So you also have a physical problem because you have no physical control on what happens in there unless you are able to identify if um, you have any intrusion. But I think the most important message between, besides everything that I mentioned is that security cannot really jeopardize you know, the operational capabilities of one of these facilities. I explained that substations, they, they are probably the most critical asset that uh, DSOs have. So if by implementing security you somehow impact the operation of a substation, then you just buy out everyone in the company, both asset management, maintenance guys. So while you think about security, you also have to be quite careful. Otherwise, you have the buyout of everyone and you cannot do anything. So in, in the end, substations need to work. So we have to think about all of these constraints while building our strategy. And the strategy came, came out from our uh, security objectives at the Distribution. So we have, let's say, the strategic objectives for cybersecurity within the company. And one of those objectives says that we need to broaden cybersecurity into all our assets, uh, what we call the mission critical systems and our digital, digital grid. And the digital grid, it's basically, you know, the digital twin of any device that you have in the, in, the, in the power grid. So you have to cover all these assets with security, with security capabilities, and you also need to assure end-to-end -end control and monitoring of what is happening in there. So if the message, if the strategy and the vision comes out from these um, clear objectives, then we need to think then how to adapt the existing substations you have and the future substations, taking that in consideration. So the first step was to establish what should be the minimum security principles for substations. And for that, we just went to best practices, to standards, and tried to figure out what should be the main principles that we want to achieve in all substations that we have, all 500 substations. So we want a secure perimeter on substations. We want a, a proper network segmentation between the different environments we have at substations, the most critical ones, the most exposed ones. We also want to assure secure communications. Of course, that is vital. Uh, as mentioned by the previous speaker. Then we, we also want to have malware protection on substations because we have technological in, uh, devices in there. They have operating systems. We need malware protection. Of course, it's not you know, the, the best of breed security technologies, but you, you need malware control. That uh, at least is our um, vision. 
We also need centralized security logging, so we need to know what is happening at substations. This is one of the biggest constraints we have today, because all the technolo technology we have in there, it's completely blocked from our uh, monitoring capabilities today. We don't know what is happening inside. And then, as much as possible, we want to harden the devices that we have at substations. That is, um, again, easier said than done, because most devices there are not capable of uh, enduring very simple uh, controls, security controls, such as using, for example, individual users or uh, enabling a security logging. You cannot do that in there. So systems are very limited. So having these principles in mind, we try to establish what should be the different pieces of the puzzle to be able to achieve that goal. So in green, you can see all these different boxes, and the boxes are basically initiatives or projects that we have in place to assure that we uh, address all the challenges and uh, you know, achieve all the goals that I've mentioned um, throughout time. And again, this strategy is not only focusing on future substations, because I would say that would be a bit easier, also because vendors now are very much concerned with security, but I have 20 year um, substations already in there that I need also to cover, because I have 500 of those. So I need to take, we need to take into consideration not only the new substations, but the, 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 the old ones. So giving just a brief overview of the different initiatives, and then I will touch base on a few of the most interesting ones that, that I brought to you. So awareness. I think this is more or less a generic, um, and a generic um, requirement, but this is something that we do focusing on the people, on the asset management people and the maintenance people that goes to substations. So we have specific trainings assuring that they understand the risk of interacting with a substation. And they also understand that when they use the USB stick, because we have to accept that they use USB sticks, they need to do it today, they need to do it on substations, at least they understand the risk and they do whatever is in their power to reduce that risk. Then we also developed um, a new centralized remote access um, layer. So we assure that all of our um, maintenance guys, being internal or external, have a new infrastructure to remotely access to all substations. And we not only have an infrastructure, a server infrastructure that um, is uh, specific for each of the vendors to make sure that you segre properly segregate what all of these vendors can do, but also that you can segment you know, the devices that the, the, the vendors use and the internal people use to access our very critical environment, our OT environment, from the very critical secure substations. So we have a new remote access platform that you use to assure you know, the segre segregation of the external environment, which is very much exposed to day-to-day -day, uh, threats and uh, our critical substations. We are also building something that uh, came up as a, 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 an amazing opportunity to build security, which is a new IPM PLS network. So the one communication layer between data centers and primary substations is currently being replaced by a new network. So of course we took that opportunity to build security by design, to identify what we could do based on this new network to assure secure communications and also that all the devices coming from this new network are properly hardening and assuring are in line with the security principles that uh, I introduce. Commissioning with security, also mentioned by, by the previous speaker, which is you, not, you, you need to assure that you have the right procedures and policy in place for when you implement a new substation. You need to follow a checklist of things assuring that you know, the antivirus is working. Communications with the CM system are working. You, know, you don't have local users with uh, default passwords. All of these things need to assure while you commission your substation. So we have a new policy assuring that every new substation covers these um, very basic requirements. And then we are also de uh, deploying, or at least we are proof making a proof of concept of implementing industrial firewalls on substations. I will give a bit more information on that um, later. We also developed um, RTU specific security requirements for new substations. I will also give a bit more detail on that. We produced an anti-malware campaign focusing on the, on the problems we were finding on substations that basically um, we had um, RTU operations being compromised by malware running uh, on the devices. So this is something that we had to address. And then uh, the next project that I will present uh, in the next slide, and we also developed an incident response plan with 
substations in mind. So assuring that if we have an incident, an intrusion on a substation, we have the right coordination within the company with the asset management guys and the maintenance guys to go there as fast as possible solving those problems. So I will now focus on a, a bit of these initiatives in more detail. And for all the other, of course, you can approach me in the end of uh, the presentation and I will be happy to explain. So at the beginning of the presentation, I explained uh, risk management as you know, the best practice to develop security. And that's exactly what we think. Of course, all the different initiatives that we are already developing couldn't wait for a proper risk assessment. So we basically got into that based on things that were coming or challenges that, that, that we were facing at the time. But we have this very interesting project in our opinion, which is assuring a risk assessment, a risk um, assessment on, uh, on our substations, existing ones and also in the future ones, uh, to identify what should be our substation roadmap in terms of uh, implementing security controls. So the first objective was to identify and evaluate what are the main threats and risks for substation. So we need to know what we have in there, what are the threats for these substations. Um, and we did that based on surveys on substations. We went to more than 10 substations. Again, we have 500. We cannot visit all of those, but we, we visit 10 substations. We also did um, some uh, documentation checking. And um, we will do an exercise, a white hat hack, uh, hacking exercise on uh, two of our substations. So based on that, we merged, we gathered all the information we needed about uh, the existing threats and risks. And then you, you need to establish what should be you know, the controls that you could put in place to reduce or mitigate those risks. So the objective of first identifying the existing risks is then to understand if you want to accept those or mitigate them. And to, to assure mitigation, we define you know, the, the most relevant controls that we needed um, in line with existing standards. And let me say that um, the focus on existing standards, namely ISO 27001, has to do with the endeavor that we are doing on the OT um, environment at EDP Distribution, which is to assure or uh, to, 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 to get uh, ISO 27000 certification in the long term. So we are now doing that certification on uh, telecommunication maintenance and operations, day-to-day -day operations. So that is the scope of ISO 27000 certification today, but we will uh, um, we will um, introduce uh, that, or try to get certification also for the substation related processes that we have. So after identifying you know, the most important controls, you need to establish a plan. What is your roadmap? How will you will get into uh, implementing, developing all of those controls and mitigating risk? So I think it is quite important if you have uh, 500 substations to have a plan and, and, and to have you know, uh, a flexible plan because in the end, you will not be able to do everything everywhere because it's 500 times every investment. So we divided substations into what we think are the most critical substations uh, for society and we had the help of our civil protection entity. So they said you have 26 very critical substations in your environment that you need to, you know, that you need to make sure that all the risks are mitigated and also the cybersecurity risks. Then we have all the substations, about 40 substations that are, are key, are vital for grid stability and grid maintenance, grid operation. And then you have all other substations. And then we also had to identify uh, what should be the roadmap for new substations, for the future substations. Of course, you can be a bit more ambitious for the substations that are still to be built. In the end, we also look for um, you know, identifying what could be the costs of implementing these controls. Because in the end, someone will ask, how much does that cost? And you need to explain what are the risks, why you thought of those controls, and how much it will cost the company. So we try to gather this project as you know, a very broad uh, message to the board in terms of what are the problems, what are the solutions, and how much that will cost the company. So moving forward to the next initiative, anti-malware campaign. So this is something that wasn't really reality in the past. So nobody installed uh, anti-malware on substations and devices because, you know, vendors didn't provide any, any, any support on that. Um, again, you know, the environment is critical and sometimes anti-malware might affect operation. It might delete, for example, a quarantine, a very critical um, process or service. So in the end, we had to think very well how to implement this because, as I said, we could not jeopardize you know, operations. 
So why did we move forward with this project, with this initiative? Because we had many infected HMIs. As I mentioned, we had some substations getting out of um, supervision because um, you know malware infections were affecting its performance, it, their resources. So we need to do something about it. And um, we also we we also try to assess how the malware got into substations, and um, it's it's a very simple answer. So either USB sticks used by the maintenance people, or infected USB sticks being used in neighboring substations that have um, direct communication with other substations. So those were the um, infection vectors. And uh, what we did was try to understand how we could implement uh, anti-malware in those substations. We had many, or we have many constraints for that. Technological limitations, some of the, um, of the systems that we have on substations cannot deal with our anti-malware solution. We have also obsolete telecommunication uh, solutions. So, as I mentioned, we have substations still talking to each other, and this is only because we have legacy telecommunication uh, technologies that we are replacing by the IP MPLS network that I mentioned. We have to use USB sticks for uh, maintenance. This is something that we cannot, uh, at, at least at this point, fight against with the maintenance people. We have also high costs for, for technological upgrade, and we cannot upgrade substation devices because when we implement those you know the regulator said okay you need to do uh, you need to implement or deploy a substation for 40 years and that covers not only the physical devices but also the digital which doesn't make that much sense for for most of us i guess but that's our regulatory environment so if we cannot replace uh, digital technology you need to think how you can you know had a, another uh, layer for security that doesn't jeopardize you know, the, 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 the digital one that you have already in there. And then we know that if we have 500 substations, we cannot have solutions that we need to manage one by one. So we need centralized solutions to manage security on our substations. So what was our approach? Uh, first of all, we conditioned uh, the implementation of our anti-malware uh, solution on um, IP communications because we still have some serial uh, substations. We, 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 we didn't cover heuristics. So if you know anti-malware solutions, you have signature-based control. So you know exactly what is the face of the anti-malware, so you block it. But then you also have heuristics. And heuristics is based on the behavior of a system. So, because you know, all substations and all devices at substations have very different behaviors, we decided not to include heuristics. Otherwise, we could, you know, the, the anti malware solution could go against the, 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 the software itself. Um, then we also have um, the antivirus client for each of the RTUs and HMIs to be fine tuned every day based on everything that came up to you know, the centralized uh, platform, assuring that. You know, all the specific uh, processes or files from the different um, uh, substation devices were excluded from, you know, the anti-malware control, assuring that we, again, will not affect the substation. So the, the interesting results we got from this campaign is that we had more substations with malware than without. So I think this is a clear message of how anti-malware, although it's not, you know, Best of breed security technology, it's quite important also for substations. Again, more substations with malware than without. So this is our reality. This is also an interesting project that we have, I believe, which is building, implementing a secure device, a secure appliance um, at all substations to assure security. So because we are very limited on what we can do on existing devices, our objective is basically to include, to implement an, an additional device that covers a lot of our security objectives. So this proof of concept wanted to, uh, wanted to, um, to, to prove if we could assure network, proper network segmentation within the substation. So we could Limit the um, limit communications between the engineering uh, network and the local network, the local critical network. We could also do malware protection based on the traffic between these networks, be between local network and also the engineering and uh, the local uh, existing network for uh, substation devices. And then logging. As I said, we don't have any visibility of what is happening on substations. And what you can do with this kind of appliance is not only to control traffic inside substation, but also monitor 
what you never did, which is monitoring LAN traffic, traffic between RTUs, EEDs, something which, although you do not control, you can uh, centrally uh, analyze in your CM system, for example, um, and also assure that you have the right visibility of what is happening on substations. So this is the, the secure architecture of our POC. We tried, we were able to prove most of the um, objectives that we wanted to achieve, not only the architecture that we were um, the, the defending, also the implementation of control between the different layers, network layers at substations, but also monitoring all the communications we have inside substation, which is something um, I believe very interesting. So we were able to do that without any impact on the substation operations, always a priority. And the scope were three substations, and um, still to be defined is how we will maintain that um, after deploying 500 devices. So that's always the challenge while de deploying new technology on substations or anything else, is that you need, um, you need to maintain that over time. So last initiative, very fast, is um, the development of, uh, and thinking about the future, the development of new security requirements for our uh, substation devices. This is something that we didn't have any in the past, so basically we have uh, functional requirements for substations and very technical um, requirements, but focusing on you know, the capabilities that we have on substations, but what we were able to produce together with um, the European Network for Cybersecurity, which is an European association focusing on, on cybersecurity and all of the, of the different members, and basically the members are DSOs as EDP distribution that have the same challenges, the same problems, was developing a list of security requirements for RTUs and HMIs. So the objective of developing this is, of course, making sure that for the future you have some sustainability, that if you are developing or deploying a new substation, you have the right security requirements to bring some sustainability to bring some protection into the future uh, substations and something that of course you cannot build back to the substations you have already in there but anyway I think this is quite an important milestone for the future and the future will keep going so you will still build substations in the near future so to finish only the key takeaways so it's clear that substations are, are digitized today, uh, very much digitized. You have as much physical infrastructure as digital infrastructure, so they are very prone to cyber attacks, and that has been proven already. They are very complex ecosystems. We have real-time requirements. They are very ubiquitous, uh, diverse, and we have to, to, to live with the legacy, but also with the new IT-based technology. So we have to live with everything together. Risk management is always the best approach. Understand what you have and what you need to do to mitigate the risks. There is no silver bullet for security, and, and, and I can tell you that for substations, for sure you don't have it, because you have many old substations and you have a very complex environment with um, a very heterogeneous uh, technology in there. So you need a mix of controls, as I mentioned before, to be able to achieve that level of protection that you want to achieve. And you need to assure a global uh, strategy for substations. So start anticipating the future, so building the requirements that I mentioned now, but also assure some kind of an agnostic solution for the present, where you can centrally manage all the infrastructure that you have, but also do not depend on the technology that you have in the field to, you know, to, 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 to achieve the best, the best strategy and implementation of the best controls on substations. So I hope that has been interesting, and if you have any questions, of course, I've been more than happy to, to reply. Thank you, and sorry for taking a few more. Thank you, Nuno. Uh, actually, so Nuno will be back with me, I think, at 10 past 12 for a short Q&A session. So if you have some of those questions, you can wait okay. uh, till then to, to, to deliver them. So quickly moving on to the next speaker. Uh, hey, hello, and good morning from my side. I prefer the microphone because I run around a bit. Uh, it's uh, funny to do that because I can't hear any sound, only myself, and you hear me on the headphones, so we didn't disturb any other sessions. Um, we leave a little bit to a higher flying level, I like to say, a little bit in the range where we look on the substation topic, what to do on substations. I'd like to introduce uh, mainly... Um, uh, let's go forward.
It's working. Where? There? I tried. Oh! <laughs> okay. Um, as maybe a few of you know, um, a, even by the regulator, it was given uh, in Germany that we need to run our utilities and our critical infrastructure, was what is defined as critical infrastructure, to a certification process. Um, that is maybe a little bit unique, and even also, may some of you know, the European structure, even for Austria, Germany and Switzerland, is a bit unique because uh, it's an environment where we have a lot of utilities uh, in different or in differentiation to other countries uh, where we only have a few distribution utilities. In Germany, we actually speak about 700. In Switzerland, I think it's around about 100 utilities. So there was a lot of things to do if you need to certify every utility in every transmission company. It's a huge certification process. And in the starting phase, there was a very nice sentence I love very much that cybersecurity race has already started for critical infrastructure. It's an endurance race and the funny thing for you if you are responsible for critical infrastructure, it's a race with a moving target. As far as you improve yourself, you improve your measures, improve your technologies, you will find also new yeah, um, access or, or infection levels that can't hurt your infrastructure. Um, what have we done? In, uh, even in Germany by law, the ISO 2701 uh, integration or the certification for uh, information security management system uh, was a must. So the, all the utilities have to pass that process within nearly one year and it ends up with a, with a certificate, which is highly, if you see ISO certification, it's a highly paper related level. But you need to validate all your vendors, all your suppliers, all your network and every, what, everything that is under uh, the responsibility of your operational networks you need to certify. Um, on which kind of levels is this task looking for? It was mainly physical grid. Why physical grid? You can say, okay, it's only copper, it's uh, big wires and you supply electricity. Uh, mainly this physical grid, like most of you know, uh, we have substations, we have ring main units, and every, every point of this where, where you install switch gears or remote control operation systems or RTUs, you can open the door and you can infect if there is a network, you can access the network of the control center. So mainly the infrastructure that you use for your OT network is very, very nearby your substations or ring main units. So there's a close relationship, it's, it's obvious, but it's a huge network in the city. It's, uh, I came from first uh, years I worked for industry, which is a, yeah, it's a closed area. You have a factory and that's it. Uh, but if you have a city, you have a huge communication network. You have thousands or hundreds of thousands of substations, ring main units, network sections, whatever you want to do. So um, it starts on a very simple level. Uh, they look for how to access a substation and it ends on a very, yeah, let's say complex level, how to interfere the network. Is it possible to reach your control center and stuff like this? So you need to drill down every kind of asset that's in the chain and has an infection risk. And then you have to do a kind of risk classification. I explain it shortly because uh, I focus on what's coming next. Uh, you have a uh, risk classification that you can say, okay, if someone access my substation and is able to access my network, what could be the effect? Shutdown of a part of my city, shutdown of the whole city, uh, implementing something that I didn't, didn't detect very early. And um, so you run towards an infrastructure assessment, a risk analysis, risk classification, and from the risk classification you came to a protection concept. And you need to document this and you need to announce an uh, information security officer inside your company who takes care about that and is responsible for all the activities. And this guy, together with a certification partner like us or like TIFF Trust IT or whatever, runs through the certification process. So in the end, you create a huge document. Some utilities are to my biggest surprise, they are very good documented. They know a lot about their assets, software versions of protection relays, whatever. A lot of utilities um, start with this process, a kind of yeah, inventory list uh, to understand what they really have in place and how things are related to. And so we have a lot of walkthrough during that phases and found also a lot of things where, where customers said, oh, it's, it's not critical, it's not critical. But sometimes you forget the easiest entrance door for something uh, because you live in that house for so long time and nothing happens. Um, but where has this process really his end, so to say? It was 
We look, in, in case of critical infrastructure, it was defined by uh, BNETSAA, which is the, the regulator here, in, in, uh, at least in Germany. It was, um, we have generation, transmission, and distribution. And anywhere behind distribution, you say, okay, this is where my certification process ends. And exactly where the, um, where the you can download it. It's quite easy. <laughs> and it's nicer than pictures. Um, and it's, the certification process ends anywhere on the responsibility uh, borders of the distribution grid. And so no one said, if it's under the responsibility of a distribution utility, you say, okay, I only certify and I only do the certification process for assets and devices that are under my responsibility and that belong to my operational network. Uh, that's, that's exactly the border. What, what we skip uh, is, okay, we have consumers, prosumers, microgrid, all the new items on the grid. Uh, we say, okay, this is beyond because they are not 110% under the control of the utility or mainly it could happen that the microgrid or prosumer or whatever not uh, is in, the, in any direct relationship, but it is connected to the grid. So you so lock them out, you say, okay, there's the border for our certification process. What happens more on the dynamical side of the distribution grid, you lock from that process because you didn't see an IT intervention towards your grid operation process. But what comes next? Um, this is one of my favorite pictures, but it's just to say what, what uh, we have in place. We now we deal about e-mobility. We think about having intelligent sensors like IoT. Um, we accept data and forecasts from other sources that not under the main responsibility of the distribution or transmission grid operator. So, but this is the what we call flexibilization. You want to include all the um, all the information that helps you to operate the grid more proper, more dynamic. But what the question is: How can you trust these sources, and how do you include these sources? into your daily decision. Actually, you can say, okay, we have a forecast, wind power, they should send us one, one day ahead data, and then you operate maybe a wind farm or a solar farm um, along to that information. But the process can be more dynamic. The, the sun radiation, for example, could change very fast by clouds, and you believe, okay, there's a straight line because someone sent you the forecast. So it's the challenge to learn how to integrate more dynamic data in your daily decision processes faster. And then you come to the point, okay, how could I trust these sources? Um, what does it mean for, for mainly our utility and transmission grid focuses? If you run along, only with some examples, uh, thinking about applications in the cloud, getting data back from the cloud, uh, leveraging maybe social media for outage identification, which is a huge topic in the US, where you even Iberdrola is dealing with that, I know. Um, where you say, okay, we look, on the social media and if some people write, okay, I'm out of power, I'm out of power, you start saying, okay, there must be an outage. Maybe you don't have the feedback from your devices, but it seems that there are some customers are not supplied. So you think about including uh, information that are not under your responsibility, including in your decision-making process and in the reaction scheme. What does it mean in the end? Maybe on this example, you send a crew out and you find out, okay, it was just a joke. It was maybe thousands of uh, fake users of, uh, of Facebook, and they write something, and you react on that. I only want to show it's not negative or positive towards that process. We need to become more dynamic. This is really the challenge. To balance the network in distribution and transmission grid, we need to include every kind of information we need in the future. But the challenge for the distribution and transmission companies, at least our customers, is how to validate and trust this information and how to integrate it and close loop it to your daily operation process. And this could also uh, indicate a kind of risk. So that means to my starting picture, like what is in the certification process, what was in the focus and what is next, what do we need to look for? It gives a big door opens and you see, okay, there's a lot of data available. I like to grab some of this data. I like to have weather forecasts in a better quality, uh, in-feed forecast. I want to know more about decentralized areas. I want to know more about certain utilities, shopping areas that becomes more flexible. But how could I trust that data and how could I validate it? Because it runs in the end to my decision-making process. Um, here are some summarizing of that questions. Taking new data sources and the challenge is really in, in real near time. If you have a data source and you say, okay, I store it for a day and then I check if the trend is right or wrong, what is the risk? But if you close loop it more and more to your reaction schemes, like 
let's say a transformer temperature. Transformer is really inside your responsibility area as a transmission or distribution utility. And you learn, okay, if the transformer becomes too hot, it should be, if the load is not that high, you run into a problem. Um, if it's an information from outside, there are a lot of customers unsupplied. Uh, you need to validate the source before you send the crew out, for example. Um, how to validate uh, data from subgrids? Like the structure I told you, you have transmission companies, a lot of distribution companies underneath, and you only need one question. Hey, I'm, I'm nearly ready. <laughs> I speak faster, okay. Um, it's um, how to validate uh, sub-utility information. Nowadays, you have a forecast from them, what is your curve, and you punish them if they create a peak or if they have a low drop. And, and you, you also, in, in Germany, you switch them off if they generate too much uh, renewable energy. You cut them by, e, by EG management. But this is not dynamic. This is just overruling someone. And uh, here, we need to learn how to deal with decentralized generation, for example. How we get data, how we validate the data, and how we include it in operational processes. Um, yeah, this is even the same thing with operate flexibilities. Uh, new data sources, whatever you have in mind. It could be an, OIT, an IoT application, it could be data from any other sources, um, but our customers need to ask themselves, how do I integrate it and how do I do risk validation for data that I not have generated and transported on my own channels? Um, and we can't do this as utilities and transmission companies because there will be millions of sensors. In the future, we need to grab the right information for our operation processes. Um, yeah, it's nearly, nearly by the end. So I want to enhance with this presentation a little bit the focus from what was in the ISO certification and what's next to be considered for our operational processes. Thank you for... for, for, for. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, any questions? OK, so then, thank you very much. I guess you'll be on the Siemens stand uh, yeah. for the rest of the week. OK. Thank you. So we take a 20-minute break now. Um, so back at uh, half past. Uh, we have two more talks and, uh, and then a Q&A session with Nuno and myself. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Good, great. So then, uh, welcome back from the coffee break. It's 11.30, let's get started. Um, uh, if, only if you want to hear yourself. I think you can just hear in the microphone, in the speaker down here, but that works or this works, as you prefer. And you have the clicker. Okay, so we're going to start this session with Massimo Bertoncini from Engineering uh, in Italy. Hello. Um, and he's got a very interesting sounding talk about uh, cyber-physical system security in the energy domain. So Massimo, the floor is yours. You have 20 minutes. Yes. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, could you hear me? Could you hear me? Okay, thank you. Uh, so, good morning to everybody. My name is Massimo Bertoncini. I'm actually the director of the uh, Research and Innovation Lab in Smart Energy Systems at Engineering Engineering Informatica based in Italy. We are a very large company as ICT technological provider. We are very and quite active also in uh, providing intelligent tools supporting uh, cyber and physical security of the smart energy grids. And the project which I'm going to present uh, this morning it's an H 2020 uh, European funded project uh, responding to a specific call tailored to provide innovative solution for uh, cyber physical security and protection of critical infrastructure. So the Defender project is exactly tailoring this very important point uh, just to consider as focus the uh, smart energy grids as critical infrastructure. I'm, I'm actually coordinating this very big project. You could, could have a look on uh, how much big is this project. So we are having uh, a very large number of partners. And, uh, the funding uh, of this project is uh, a bit less than 7 million of euro. 
we are covering uh, uh, a variety of new countries with our partners and uh, we are having 18 partners from nine countries and engineering is actually taking the lead for uh, uh, this project. We are actually start on the 1st May 2017, so we are mid-life right now of over covering over 36 months. Uh, just to a very quick introduction of the context, uh, why uh, critical energy infrastructure? Because uh, they are impacting uh, all our uh, everyday life. Uh, there are a number of other uh, critical infrastructure like water, like telco, like health critical infrastructure, but the energy is at the very earth because from energy depends right now with the emerging digitalization uh, all our everyday lifestyle. So you could see why ele electricity is really at the heart of our uh, investigation. And what we could mention is that security is really crucial for the smart energy critical infrastructure because from one end, ICT, as mentioned before, is growing, is bringing uh, a lot of new potentialities thanks to creating the potentiality for interconnecting a number of stakeholders which were not interconnected before. You could see in these figures how they are now, thanks to the ICT, these stakeholders uh, working along the energy value chain now are interconnected. But of course, this increase in interconnectivity brings a lot of threats, a lot of vulnerabilities to the network, a lot of cyber risks which need to be fully addressed. Not to forget even what we call the human layers. So it is not a pure technological landscape or challenge, but even we need to take into two considerations even uh, the human beings as active stakeholders with a view to effectively manage the problem of the security, going beyond the pure cyber security. And even last but not least, we have to consider that in the last years, uh, cyber attacks on the power grid are constantly increasing with respect to the sophistication. Having said that, as in, in, uh, you could see that sorry, we are having and we are addressing a variety of critical infrastructure attack types. You could see that we could move from uh, central radiating attacks to attacking one of the critical infrastructure and creating cascading effects, or you could even having uh, parallel attacks of different types to several critical infrastructure we are interlinked together. And these are a variety of critical attacks which we are uh, having, where we are having uh, an investigation in our projects. Just to, to set the landscape, all of us are aware of this Ukrainian grid cyber attacks in December of 2015, but even uh, there was a news on the Financial Times recently how much important is the, the emerging critical infrastructure risk assessment and cyber security solution for the, for the smart grid. Not to forget even the famous European blackout, European blackout which is not due explicitly to, to some uh, cyber attacks, but it is something which we need to take into consideration when we have to consider as a whole the whole package of the security of the smart grids as we are doing in the Defender project. And uh, uh, just to, to mention that what is the state of the art? What is our starting point in the critical energy infrastructure? First of all, uh, the actual landscape is actually uh, quite fragmented, I would say, uh, because the solutions which have been provided right now are either limited in the trade scope, either cyber, either addressing physical threats in isolation, and are even uh, often limited in the coverage of the energy value chain. So maybe they are addressing TSOs, maybe they are addressing uh, uh, generation plants, but there is no interconnection between the, the different solutions. Very seldom they are able to involve human dimensions, citizens or workers. And uh, last but not least, even this point is uh, quite important for us, no systematic relationships between the power network operators and security operators or service providers. So 
everybody is doing this work on its own. Normally, power network operators pretend to do for uh, normal country level security purpose, taking the lead in this landscape. And even uh, last but not least, uh, there are now emerging a number of challenges at the level of the interaction and procedures for uh, linking even uh, CRTs and even uh, ISAC, both at governance and technological level. So how this regional or multinational organization should be interlinked, linked, it is not fully clear at the level of the governance, at the level of technological implementation. We are having an ESA in Europe for the ICT or network security. We are having ESAC with different functionalities, but the situation is staying in the middle. So there is no clear connection among the power network operators and these emerging uh, organizations. Having said that, you could see our main defender scope. So we are covering all the energy values range from transmission network to distribution to uh, sustainable energy district. And we are even covering, in particular, physical cyber security and aging workforce. So we are including, incorporating even uh, uh, the attention to the, to the workers and citizens. And even we are taking a bit less of attention, but we are considering as well natural disaster and problems they're having from aging infrastructure. You could see a number of objectives. Uh, these objectives are related to analyzing CEI, so critical energy infrastructure traits and risks, considering situational awareness and comparison of the combined cyber and physical uh, threats. And we are having, uh, we are implementing even uh, innovative and dynamic counter measure toolbox to deal with combine this combination of physical and, uh, uh, and uh, cyber threats. And we are even trying to, to create an, uh, a stakeholder groups. We are doing even this work uh, for uh, aggregating a variety of relevant stakeholders coming from the smart energy grids and deriving even from law enforcement agents and even from uh, this new uh, ENISA mandated C CERT at different level and even information sharing center. And just to give a look on uh, uh, major innovation streams in Defender, as I mentioned before, we are modeling this critical energy infrastructure as a distributed cyber physical systems, and we are, we are modeling the potential interaction between cyber and physical threats, physical attacks. And uh, we are considering even uh, a novel adaptive security governance level where the basic premise is to uh, consider that the security as a, uh, should not be like to say it should not be uh, costless, but we are having a cost, so we have to consider how much effective is some or are some specific level of the security against the planned security uh, countermeasure in order to dynamic adapt. And uh, we are having even uh, a combined utilization of situational awareness, anticipated prediction and detection of cyber physical threats and attacks, and combining even with artificial intelligence techniques for better detect and predict a given combination of cyber and physical threats. And last but not least, it is something where we are investing a lot of work. So bringing really people center stage, it is really relevant for us. We where we are having not only uh, workers, but even citizens. We are working on the awareness of citizens, for instance, uh, citizens living uh, uh, nearby critical installations. As, as you could see in one of the, my following slides, these people uh, are trained, are engaged, in order just to provide, in a sharing economy model, just cooperation with the power network operator, with the LIA, so with the law enforcement agencies. And that is something where I'm referring to this sharing economy business models, just in order just to combine all the ingredients 
because we strongly consider that only if uh, people of its normal citizens are aware of the problem, they could cooperate with a view to create a better understanding of the problem and to contribute to fixing or to, to mitigate uh, the problem of the cyber physical security of the critical energy infrastructure. Just to give you a quick overview on what we call end-to-end -end closed loop solution, uh, from monitoring to optimizing critical energy infrastructure security management, the first point is that we are modeling a variety of sensors. So we are considering cyber sensors, we are considering physical sensors, and we are considering even human sensors. So human beings living in the vicinity of these installations are considering like virtual sensor, and they could contribute to give us, to give the, the Defender Framework further information to which we could even infer or, thanks to our artificial intelligence tools, assess risk and understanding uh, how much effective is our strategy for preventing and mitigating threat. So you could see in your bottom how many sensors are integrated in, uh, in our framework. Then, this is the second step, CEI security state awareness, trying to detect if to what extent something is going wrong. Then we are having uh, what we call security state perception. So perceive the, and estimate the future near state of the critical energy infrastructure. And finally, just to, to pass to, to move to the comprehension, so understand what's happening, how to mitigate the, the threats which we detected. Last steps, what we call security state guarantee. So apply the mitigation plan, the, apply the countermeasure toolbox in order to mitigate threats. And the last step will be to have a feedback over the full life cycle governance in order just to, uh, to, to fit this closed loop and this adaptation of security governance model so we can have uh, a feedback in order to understand how much effective we are applying this proposed level of the countermeasure on the uh, critical energy infrastructure, cyber physical security. Uh, so for us, CAI security is going to combine strategic level with operational approach. So we are having uh, the combination of security by design with security and operational level. So rather than to, to plan to have everything by design, we we are having a combination of tools which are planned to operate at and to be instantiated at the design level, like security assessment, life cycle assessment, risk impacts, self-feeling of the smart energy grids, versus security and operational level. Here you can have a, a snapshot of our Defender Oval architecture. So we are having a multi-layer architecture. So you can see from the bottom, the layer one, information gathering, monitoring and situational awareness. On the top of this layer one, we are having the layer two, which is related to the information processing, threats, prediction and detection, and threat management and mitigation. And finally, which is even quite more and more important, uh, which is having a clear impact at the level of the governance about sharing information center European level, we are having this incident information sharing platform at pan-European level. So you could see what kind of framework we are actually elaborating and how are the three different layers in our architecture are uh, uh, fully linked one each other and are able to virtualize and to, to manage information coming from uh, uh, the cyber and even from the physical threats. For instance, for physical threats, we are having uh, even a number have uh, tools, technological tools for solution, including leaders, including drone, sensors, and cameras, from which we could have even uh, information about uh, somebody or something uh, applying uh, a, a physical threats, having eventually cyber or eventually physical implication. Uh, just to uh, to give some information, some more information on the, on the, on the layer one, on the defender monitoring. Uh, as you could see in this slide, we are having a, a different components of our monitoring toolbox where we are combining one in our models, physical fiber and human, 
human in particular it's quite important we are acting as first responders first responders in the territory together with the physical and, and cyber threats which we are where we are adding a, a, a night artificial intelligence based analytics and machine learning uh, uh, management and processing. This is a, a more detailed information uh, for what concerns the workflow. So stage one, state of the environment. Stage two, security monitoring framework. Stage three, situation comprehension. Stage four, security control center and action toolbox. So and over the top, you could see this pan-European incident information sharing platform. Just to give you a couple of information on uh, how we are going just to assess or to move for security state awareness to comprehension. So you could see uh, that we are having a threats and attacks identification, which is based on extensive modeling based on semantically enhancing attack trees. So this is the normal graphic representation where we are trying just to, to moving in order to understand where we are and try to understand if there is specific threats in attack and we are having an extensive usage and combination of big data analytic te techniques you could see that we are combining a near real-time processing for object abstraction we intend media like cameras so from the portable objects or fixed the like in the vicinity of a critical installation data mining on locks and even machine learning for intrusion detection. We are having a couple of lights. So this is uh, one uh, where I'm going to, to show you how in our modeling, we are having a combined incident and mitigation decision support system in order to understand and to, res to better respond to the threat. So we are having a, a, a co-simulatory input. For us, co-simulator is, is going to combine physical and threat all together. We are having a phase of detection, a study at the level of the impact and risk, as I pointed out before, and a mitigation phase. All are combined in order to give inputs to the incident and mitigation DSS. Last slide, which I would like to, to, to discuss with you, is for people acting as cybersecurity center, how here we are having a, a we are utilizing uh, a blockchain infrastructure, which is, which is provided by a number of partners in order to provide a trusted bilateral communication channel, channel between the citizens living in the vicinity of the installation and uh, the law enforcement, law, law enforcement agency operator or the power network operator. So we are experimenting, we are making available this infrastructure in order just to make people aware and to make even people willing to contribute. So very nice exercise for uh, um, creating, uh, for increasing awareness and engagement of people even for activity contributing. Uh, from uh, from people on, on this cyber security uh, combined cyber security uh, for the smart energy grids and just to close that we are uh, actually uh, large for large scale trials all over Europe so we are having uh, one pilot in LS in Slovenia on transmission network one pilot in Italy in uh, one distribution system operator in Azmeterni. We are having a big wind farms in the south of, in the south of Italy, and in France we are having a, a big book generation plant brought by Engie. So you could see that we are covering all the uh, all the menu uh, all the value chain. So for the time being, we are having uh, developed all the uh, necessary software. So this is now the time for going to deploy. In, in during these days, people from the Defender project is going just to validate all the. Uh, technologies uh, against these four pilots that, as you could see, are covering both cyber and physical threats and are covering all the energy value chain from the transmission to the distribution system to the big uh, bulk generation of distributed energy plants. You could see that the major achievement uh, today. And uh, as final message to you, uh, it is a very ambitious project, but uh, what is extremely interesting is the, the combination of the know-how. So we are not having only the technological know-how from a solution, a security solution provider or electricity 
operators on board, we are having uh, even uh, the perspective of the law enforcement agency. So we are having Italian policies on board and even other uh, stakeholders. And we are having uh, even the support of the citizen. So this is extremely relevant for us just to launch this message that the cybersecurity of a critical infrastructure relevant uh, for the, our everyday life will not include only technological perspective of angles, but it is necessary to incorporate even different perspectives. So the perspective of the traditional law enforcement agents, but even the perspective as much as possible of the citizens in order to make them aware or increase their awareness. And this is my last slide. And uh, thank you just for, uh, for you. I don't know if there are, if, if there are any uh, questions right now. Or no, I, sorry, we have run out of time, I'm afraid. <laughs> so thank you very much, Massimo. Uh, I think, are you with the European projects? Sorry? The European project. Yes, it's a European yeah. project. The name is actually it's just... Uh, yeah, but there's an area if people want to come and ask you uh, Yes, question. but we, we, don't, we are not having oh, okay. uh, a specific boots for this project, but I'm You're around. 20 minutes I'm here uh, around just if uh, okay. anybody is uh, willing just to, to have questions to coordinate with myself. Thank you, Massimo. Okay, so then the last presentation of the session uh, goes to uh, Daniel Shugru from CyberX. Yes. Please, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes? All right, excellent. So welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Daniel Shugru, and I'm, I'm here to talk about a research project that we did over the past year that measures the uh, vulnerability of electric and other ICS systems uh, around the world. So we conducted or we uh, monitored over 850 networks in across six different continents, and I'm here to present the findings to you. I'm uh, just a quick note about who I am. I have. My name is Daniel Shagru. I have 20 years experience in uh, mobile, SaaS, and security. Um, today at CyberX, which is a, a SCADA um, defense and security company. Uh, and I'm previously at Akamai Technologies, and before that at RSA Technologies, and then before that at, at Nokia. Um, if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand today. Um, anyone who participates will get a free copy of the report itself, which I have here. Um, or um, if you don't have time or you don't care to ask today, you can at me on Twitter or send me an email directly, dan.shagru at cyberx.com. Um, so a word about you know, why we did this, what's, what is the problem, and maybe I can get a quick show of hands. Uh, how many of you are from electric utilities? Okay. Most of you, I guess, yes. And how many of you are uh, in some some sort of security capacity at your company? Okay, great. And how many of those are in OT security? Oh, perfect, okay, great. This is excellent. So let me give out a couple of, uh, just for participating, get people warmed up here. Thank you for raising your hand. Actually, okay, I'll just take one. And uh, you need one. Oh, thank you very much, okay. Okay, so. So you, if you're in security, you know what the problem is. The problem is that we have a, a convergence of IT and OT, um, we have, which has led to uh, or has enabled adversaries who happen to be motivated. Um, and we have networks which are vulnerable. Why are they vulnerable? Because they were built 20 or 30 years ago without security built in. Um, and now, if you were to upgrade, you'd have to shut down your plant, and that leads to many, many different problems. So OT is much more uh, difficult to maintain than IT, right? It's that, it's that simple. Um, and you know that there was an attack in the Ukraine, uh, uh, let's see, two years ago now, um, and then another attack um, uh, a little bit over 18 months ago, uh, both of which took down the power grids. So that's getting the attention of electric utilities um, in Europe, in uh, the Americas, and in Asia, and has led to people to look for uh, solutions. Um, so one of the things, so CyberX provides one of those solutions, basically asset inventory and management. Um, but one of, because we do that, one of the things we're able to do is when we do a proof of concept at a prospect, not a customer, but a prospect, we um, tap into a span port 
and monitor network activity. And so, and because there's a big market out there for this, we're able to do that on many networks. In the last year, over 850 networks, um, which means that uh, we are able to compile all of the data that we see and then make a booklet about it and present it to you here today. So basically what I'm going to, I'm just going to show you a few snapshots from the report and if you're interested I'll give you more, a copy and you can look at more. If you're interested more you can download the whole thing uh, on the website. Um, but one of the top four findings was the fact uh, that the air gap as we've heard about it is a myth. Um, you know, some people in security in um, OT environments talk about the fact that they don't necessarily need security because their OT network is air-gapped. Well, in the networks that we monitored, and this is not surveys, but actually monitored, we found that 40% of industrial sites had at least one direct connection to the internet. Now, why do they have this? In some cases, perfectly legitimate reasons, right? You need to download an update to your PLC. Um, in other cases, we've literally seen uh, OT workers surfing the internet um, from their workstations in, in their IT environments. Um, you know, checking sports scores, for example. So that's obviously a problem. Um, at, at the very least, you would probably agree that we should know where those internet connections are, shut down any that aren't absolutely positively necessary, and monitor any that need to stay on. I mean, it's more or less common sense, right? But I think the maybe the important point is that if you have direct connections to the internet, you're, you're not alone. Many companies have this. Um, and with digitization as a key business driver, we'll see more of these going forward, right? In every other place other than this room right now, there are pressures to digitize, to become more efficient, uh, to be able to upload automatically. And we're probably the only people who are saying, well, well, wait, slow down. You don't necessarily want to increase connectivity because once you do, you provide another pathway for the adversary in. Um, I want to give out another, I'm getting a very interested look here, and I know you, you raised your hand earlier, but I don't think you got a book. You don't have, you got one. Oh, okay, he did get one. <laughs> yeah. All right, so the second, the second point is broken windows, and I'm talking, of course, about uh, Windows OS. Um, in the networks that we surveyed, 53% of sites had uh, legacy Windows systems like Windows XP or, or Windows 2K. Um, as you are probably aware, legacy Windows systems can't be updated. They have vulnerabilities, many vulner vulnerabilities built in. It's not always possible to upgrade them, as you probably know much better than I do. You're running 24-7, you can't shut it down. Um, and thus, what do you do? Maybe, you know, you implement a monitoring system to look at the traffic that's coming to and from this Windows system since it does have uh, vulnerabilities that can lead to attacks like uh, NotPetya. Um, the other thing you can do is you can segment your network. Also not easily done, um, but many of the networks that we see are completely flat with thousands of devices and no segmentation. And that, as you know, leads to many vulnerabilities. Um, the third uh, somewhat disturbing fact was that we observed was that 69% of sites had passwords traversing the network in plain text. In other words, uh, the sites are using protocols like SNMP version one, which hasn't been, uh, which is not encrypted, um, or non-secure FTP. And as you know, a plain text password exposed to a sniffer is very easily exposed. In most of the public attacks that we've seen, We've seen sniffers used to um, perpetrate at least part of the attack, usually the reconnaissance phase, to move sideways through a network. So passwords traversing in plain text are not a good thing, and most of the uh, ICS networks that we monitor have them. Um, the fourth major finder is the, the, the lack of antivirus. Now this is, I think, actually getting better, believe it or not. Uh, maybe 10 years ago, most of the vendors for PLCs uh, recommended against using antivirus. These days, many of the AV uh, vendors are certified by the uh, PLC makers, and thus not everyone in the OT or the electric space is averse to installing AV. However, we do still see 57% of sites have no automatic AV. They might have AV, but they're updated via sneaker nets, in other words, via USB drives, which introduce their own vulnerabilities. 
Um, and so we're leaving ourselves uh, exposed. 16% uh, of sites have at least one wireless access point. Um, this is a, an actual picture of one from, a, uh, from, from Emerson's website. They're advertising them. I mean, they do have benefits to uh, use in your site, but they can also be compromised. For instance, via KRAC or, or WPA2 vulnerabilities. Um, they're gateways to malware, such as VPN filter. Um, they can be used to capture Modbus traffic, learn about the protocols that you have operating in your network, um, and they can, they can be used to launch attacks on, on OT endpoints. So the routers themselves should be patched regularly and inventoried um, in order to prevent these types of attacks. Um, finally, the last, I think this is the last point from the survey itself before we get into you know, what can be done. 84% of industrial sites have at least one remotely accessible device. Now, what I mean by this, this is not, I don't mean remote from the internet, that we've already captured in the first slide. Here I mean a device within your internal network um, that is accessible over, for example, SNMP. Um, and this is another way in which attackers will traverse uh, laterally through a network in order to get more information about uh, the network that they're about to attack. Um, if you have um, a PLC, for example, or a workstation, or an HMI with access protocols like, like RDP, VNC, or SSH, you're basically making it easier um, for attackers with the stroll on the credentials, credentials, which they've just sniffed because your passwords are in plain text, uh, to learn how the equipment is running and how to uh, manipulate it. So anything so far surprising to people? Is it, you, you know things are bad, yeah? Ever, <laughs> so we, yeah, we know things are pretty bad. So and and this, the, the, I guess this, um, what may be hopefully is useful about this particular survey is that it's based on actual network traffic. It's not based on surveys. So if you think you're the only utility that hasn't updated yet, you're not. Um, on the other hand, if you think that because things are bad, you should put your head in the sand uh, like an ostrich, then maybe that's not the answer. Maybe there are other things we can do. I mean, should we give up hope? No, there are there are other hopes, says Yoda. Right? I mean, it's not it's not just Luke. Um, what can you do? You can identify the crown jewels. Uh, you can illuminate the most likely attack paths to those crown jewels. You can practice what I'll I'm going to quickly define as cyber hygiene, and then you can create a manageable OS upgrade schedule. So, what do I mean by identified crown jewels? Well, you can't protect everything all the time. We, we know that but you can protect some things most of the time. So if you identify what in your plant would cause the most catastrophic loss or loss of revenue or cause the worst lawsuit or you'd suffer the worst brand reputation if it was compromised or blown up, um, which assets are the most uh, valuable intellectual property, for example, then you can start to think about how do I protect those assets as opposed to everything all at once. Um, Doing this, identifying the assets, requires conversations with business leaders, with OT personnel. Um, and examples can be things like safety systems, critical production lines, transformers and compressor stations, um, and in the farmer industry, historians. Once you've identified the uh, crown jewels, what you want to do is illuminate the most likely attack path to that crown jewel. Um, there are vendors out there like uh, CyberX that will do this for you. Um, in other words, they'll take from the bottom, if you've identified PLC 11 as your um, most vulnerable, I'm sorry, most uh, valuable crown jewel, then you can work backwards from that. Okay, that PLC has a CVE that's known. It's connected to this infrastructure server. Um, there's a control center there that could be compromised through another, a different known CVE. Um, and another control center, and then that particular control center is actually connected to the internet. You could block that connection, you could better monitor the connections between these devices, um, or you could simply take one of these devices out of the loop in order to better protect the crown jewel. These things are not easy, uh, but they are, they are doable. Um, the next thing, and this is in some cases somewhat uh, controversial, but it's just to pr uh, pr practice cyber hygiene. And I, I use this term to mean the things that you ought to absolutely positively have to do no matter what. 
And so if we think about it like just brushing your teeth before you go to bed, you don't question it, you just do it. Um, so there are some things that you, you just can't do in an ICS network. Whenever you bring a new um, PLC or workstation online, you can't leave the default password on. That just has to be automatic. You've got to change the password for any new device you bring into your network. Um, that's maybe the easier of the three. The second one's a little bit harder is to clean any USB, laptop, or, or mobile phone that's going to be require insertion or uh, a connection to the ICS network. That's a little bit harder to implement, but it, it can be done. There are utilities out there that do it successfully. And then if you are going to allow um, connections to the internet, allow whitelisting connections only. So only to that vendor site where you need to download the, up, the upgrade um, or only to you know, whatever um, site that you have business justification for visiting uh, exists. So that's, that's what, we, what I call uh, cyber hygiene. And then finally, and this is really the toughest for, for all of you, is to create a manageable OS upgrade and patch schedule. Um, I'm aware that there are limited or even non-existent maintenance windows. But I, I don't know, so several of you raised your hands that you're in OT security. How many of you have downtime during which you can up, um, install upgrades? Of the four or five who raised their hands, how many have downtime to install upgrades? No, none, okay. So the, the, the challenge is when you have no down, you have no downtime. Um, the challenge is if you never upgrade a Windows system, or if you're buying parts off of eBay to you know, service old hardware, you will have downtime eventually. Right? It just won't be on your schedule. So that, that might be an argument that you can bring up through management if you're not working through a CIO. Hey, we need to do this on our schedule so that we're not doing it on the adversary schedule. Right? There has to be some period of downtime, some point during the year. Even if it's, you know, so start with 15 minutes a year, maybe you can move to 15 minutes a quarter, and you can do a few of the patches that are available. Um, so that's probably the toughest one. Looks like I have some sympathetic uh, ears anyway. People understand that this is an issue. Um, and, uh, you know, just to sum up, we have, we have threat actors out there that are varied and real. It's not just nation states. The anonymization of currency, things like Bitcoin, have made payoffs easier for the bad guys. Um, the industrialization of tools have made attacks easier. And of course, the nationalization of attacks have made greater resources available to the bad guys. Our assets and our networks are soft, but there is hope, right? We can identify the crown jewels. We can illuminate the paths to those crown jewels. We can practice hygiene daily and then create a manageable patch or upgrade schedule. For bonus points here, does anybody know what this is a picture of? So it's the Battle of Vienna. Uh, 16, oh yes, it's 1653, I believe, was the battle. This is, historians believe this is the turning point in the war against the Ottomans. Right here in Vienna, one of the greatest classes of civilizations turned a corner. Um, so I like to use this, I mean, for many years, all hope was lost for uh, Austria and points uh, west. Here in Vienna, the tide was turned. So maybe we can begin to turn the tide a little bit against the threat actors by taking a few small steps on the margins to make the ICS networks we control safer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Samuel. That was a really excellent talk. There was a lot of interest in your report. I'm sure uh, a few yeah. people will approach you afterwards to, to get more copies. Sure, okay, great. Thank you. Great, so now we have um, one last session while uh, those copies are being handed out. Where um, Nuno, Nuno and I from EDP are going to have a short Q&A session. So I'll just quickly rearrange the stage a touch so that we can sit down and, and talk to each other. It won't be a moment.
<laughs> okay, good. So <clears throat> maybe Nuno, you could, for those that weren't uh, here earlier for your presentation, perhaps you could just briefly introduce yourself. So my name is Nuno Medeiros. I work for EDP Distribuição. I'm the OT cybersecurity um, department head. So I've been working in cybersecurity for at least uh, seven years now. I've been heading the department for the last two years, and we have been uh, quite engaged into um, into developing uh, cybersecurity within our OT environment, from you know data center infrastructure, our mission critical systems to our um, dispersed technology for substation smart metering devices, all of that. So yeah, this is my uh, my story. Okay, so just briefly then, I'm uh, Paul Smith. I'm a senior scientist at the AIT, Austrian Institute of Technology. I've been doing sort of cybersecurity research uh, for energy, for the energy networks basically for, for about five or six years now or so. So, and we know each other, which is nice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was just gonna kick off uh, with a question that was sort of inspired by your presentation earlier. Um, so I'll do this question and then the idea is that we'll open the floor to you guys to, I guess, primarily address questions to Nuno. Um, so in your presentation, um, so you uh, essentially identified your key primary substations to address security at, and a major component of that was sort of uh, taking stock of the current security posture of those, those devices. So that's kind of like analyzing the vulnerability of those infrastructures. And when we think about risk, is the threat component uh, of, of that, that risk equation. So from, from you as, a, as an organization, how, where do you typically get your threat intelligence from and, and what are the sources that you, you get? Okay, in terms of, of threat intelligence, um, there are many different sources. Um, you might just as well Google for, for what is happening elsewhere. But we, we typically have two different um, alternatives, so at national level and international level. So at national level, we have a memorandum of understanding with, um, with the National Cybersecurity Center, and basically, as a critical infrastructure, as a company managing a critical infrastructure, we can rely on the National Cybersecurity Center to you know, inform us on the current uh, status of threats, either to, you know, general threats uh, for any t kind of technology or more directed the threats for, for OT or the energy sector. So this is something that at national level it is managed by the National Cybersecurity Center that somehow integrates, of course, you know, the views and what is happening on all the different na national uh, critical infrastructures uh, that are in Portugal. At international level, we base that mainly on uh, cooperation. And for cooperation, we are, uh, for example, part of the, the EE ISAC, the European Energy Information Sharing and Analysis Center, which is basically an association with many different uh, members from DSOs to TSOs, uh, to vendors, to integrators, to academia. Um, AIT is also part of the EE ISAC. And basically, we, we, we create a, a, a community uh, that trust each other and share their challenges, but also the, their threats, their current, um, their current threats and incidents. So the idea of this kind of communities, and that's something that we are taking advantage of, the e. Isaac, is definitely learn with each other. Um, again, as I mentioned, you can learn on how to address challenges, on what have been the successes and failures of different projects, for example. But another interesting thing is also threat intelligence, because if you think about WannaCry, we were all in contact, uh, understanding what each other was doing to to stop the threat, because uh, at least that we know of, nobody got really infected from, from the WannaCry. But anyway, that information was um, real-time being, um, being um, done by all the members, and this brought us a great competitive advantage against the, the, the bad guys, because we were understanding what was the impact of the, um, the controls being implemented by the different companies, you know, all, what was the information they were gathering at their own national level. So this is something that, of course, we, we are very happy to take advantage from the, um, the EISAC cooperation. And then there are other communities, interesting communities, where we can do that. Uh, we are part of EDSO, we are part of EUTC. These are all associations of companies as ours that really have the same threats, the same challenges. So in some way, 
the best way to proceed, the best way to be prepared is to align with each other, is to learn from each other. So this is something that we're also doing uh, with all these associations that uh, are facing the same, the same problems. Thank you, Nuno. So, um, are there any questions from the floor? Um, if there are, then we have the opportunity for you to use this nice box <laughs> to speak into. Uh, are there any questions? Come on, you have a, an energy utility here ready to answer all your questions. There must be something burning. Okay then, so I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll pick something up then again from your presentation. So as you were kind of working through um, basically the, this, this process of securing your substations, one of the major components of that is was setting up a, a risk management program, ISO 27000. So could you give us some insights into what are the kind of main challenges in getting that up and running mm -hmm. and, and how that's kind of going now? I mean, is it starting to produce results that are interesting? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so I think that's actually one of the biggest challenges that we have, either at substation level or any any level of the OT environment, is to establish the risk uh, management uh, process because it takes a lot of time. Basically, that's that's the main problem. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort from from the company. So if you think about ISO 27000, we are currently implementing the ISMS for that, and. One of the things that we decided uh, at some point was, okay, let's take uh, a, a step behind and understand what should be our strategy to, to implement the ISMS because it's, it's too complex, it's too broad. It goes from risk management into uh, implementing a lot of different processes into complying with the security requirements. It's a lot of things. Uh, having metrics, having goals uh, established, it, it, it's quite um, a, a complex process. So in the end, what we decided was, if we want to systematize risk management as part of the, our ISMS, we should do it, you know, um, we, we should slice the elephant in, in different pieces. So what we decided was to go forward with, um, with the certification, focusing on the telecommunication technology that we are now implementing. As I mentioned in my presentation, we are replacing all our communications with primary substations with a new IPMLS network, IT network, let's say. So we are fo focusing our uh, certification on that. And then what we, we, we have what we call a program, certification program. So first step, telecommunication technology. Second step, it's mission critical applications. Third step, it's substation automation devices. Then we go into medium voltage um, automation and then smart grids. So within, within this program, with this roadmap, what we will assure is that on each of the steps, we will be learning and in, in introducing, embedding in our in our DNA, in the DNA of the company, the processes uh, that you need to establish to, to, to manage and operate the ISMS. And again, as I mentioned, it's complex. So, and just to point directly to your question, risk management, very complex. It takes a lot of time. It's not only a, a, a evaluating risks, but also having a risk treatment plan because that's part of the the ISMS. So in some sense, since we are at the first stage, I think we are learning a lot. We are introducing a lot of new concepts in the company. One of those is establishing and maintaining the risk management process because in the past what we've done is a bit different, which is, okay, I will install this new device in my network, so let's risk assess what is happening with this device. So, you know, this is not the context of an ISMS. It's how will this device introduce new risks to your existing technology? And of course, what are the risks of this device also? But it's a lot more broader and a lot more connected with your um, broader um, technological ecosystem. So it's, it's a bit more difficult than, um, than we thought uh, at the beginning. But it's definitely something that I would uh, suggest uh, companies. It's ISMS is a great uh, learning experience and in the end you will find that all of the important things to develop security are there from risk management which is I think key as I mentioned to implementing firewalls which is a bit simplistic but still important. Thank you Nuno. A question, wonderful. So let me see if I can throw this in an elegant way at you. <laughs> Good. Well done. <laughs> So this is kind of a left field question for you, Nuno. Uh, so you're going from an old TDM legacy network to IPMPLS. Has that had some effect on your security awareness programs and what your employees need to be aware of now? Y yes, yes. I think 
one of the things that came up with the new network is uh, simplicity. Because finally, we have not three different SDMs networks plus uh, three pilots that we had for IPM PLS. Finally, we don't have a complete, uh, let's say, a multiple uh, technology env technological environment for telecommunications. So we are replacing all of that for a new IPM PLS. So in the end, I think it will make our life a lot simpler. On one hand, because it's quite performant, it's a performant network, and today we still have some remote connection based on analog um, connections. So telephony, we still have that. So we will be left out of that legacy telecommunication technology and have the IPM PLS network. So in some sense, what we are explaining um, our, our people now is that these very IT-based technologies will introduce new risks. I think these risks are easier to manage because if it's IT-based technology, most of the security controls you have today, it's IT-related. So in some sense, I, I think our work, our job will be uh, simpler. And another thing that I think it's important is that by default, or, or, or by design, since we were implementing this new network, we were assuring that we were taking the right security measures while building it. So if you think about secure connections, segregation of different services, critical services, uh, remote access, you know, device hardening, all of that was taken care of at design stage of this project. So every you know, every vulnerability, every risk that we have with the current, um, with the current uh, multi-layer telecommunication technology that, that we have will be disappearing. So one of the examples, one of the, the existing risks that we have, and I also mentioned it in, in my presentation, it's about uh, malware uh, propagation. So today, because we still have old age legacy SDM connections, that have a layer two connection between uh, um, substation rings, you have malware prop propagating from one substation to the other. They are easily communicating, so they are infecting other devices. And this is something that we can easily solve with a new uh, telecommunication technology because substations do not need to communicate with each other. And if there's a use case, for example, for teleprotection, if you need teleprotection between two substations, that is something that you can really fine tune in terms of what kind of traffic do you need to assure, what are the quality of service uh, requirements that you need for that. So it's a whole new world building this, this new network that uh, also brings us, I think, a lot less risks than the current environment that we have. So I'm very happy with, uh, with this project. Well, thank you. And my next question was going to be, did you convince the protection engineers, but you already answered yeah. that. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, any more questions? Another question from the audience? Here we go, one at the front. Perfect. I have a question about how you implemented the, the risk management process. So is this a distributed process, so where you have uh, local uh, contact points in your organizations, all in, in the different countries, or is it more a centralized approach? So how did you organize the mm -hmm. risk management? Okay, that, that's, a, that's a good question, because that's actually very important, because you have to get the buy-in from everyone. Because in the end of the risk management, what you have is risks, priorities, and owners. And if you will make someone the owner of a risk, it's better to, to involve him in the process. Otherwise, it will say, I don't have anything to do with that. So that's a really good question. So what we did, because we, we decided to, to separate you know, the, 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 the approach in, into different stages, so thinking about the first stage, which is the IPM PLS telecommunication network, what we did was to identify within the company, and it's a national company, so it's only in Portugal, it's limited to Portugal, but within the company, what are the areas, the departments that somehow interact with the new network? So you can think about um, OT department, where I work, uh, asset management department for substations, uh, and then you have to involve also people from legal, from human resources, because you have a lot of different controls aimed on the people that work within these technologies. You have to involve business continuity people. So it's definitely a process that should involve as much per people as possible, uh, that, that actually makes sense to involve because they have some kind of role. Because, you know, the process needs to be done together with these people. If you have only security guys doing a risk assessment, in the end, you will probably get, you know, a very difficult to implement program uh, as uh, for risk mitigation because we are a bit, 
ambitious, I think. We are a bit more worrying than others because we work on security and we know <laughs> how things are. But in the end, involving people from security and then the people that work and then uh, that have an operational role within your environment is very important to balance you know security needs operational needs and also that in the end when you get the list of risks you get the buy-in from the people that will need to do something about it. and for example on on human resources you know if you want to um, do um, how do you call it uh, people screening if you want to do people screening, you cannot do it by yourself. You have to introduce new procedures to when, when you integrate, when you recruit new people to assure that you do that screening. And that should be part of the, a new policy. So if those guys need to introduce a new policy, they need to be involved since the beginning. So that's just an example of on how involving, you know, the organization as a whole, all the different roles that you need uh, will help you in, in, in this process. Uh, so it's quite important to have that all of those people working together. Great, thank you. So uh, we're out of time. It's 12.30, uh, it's lunch time. I think you can all smell it. <laughs> um, so please join me in thanking Nuno for those really interesting uh, insights, please. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> so this closes the session. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your week. And uh, I guess we'll be around for, for more questions and answers if you, if you, if you wish. Thanks.